Hello, this is Bill Worrell with Virginia Cooperative Extension. Today's episode of 15 Minutes in the Forest is going to be at the University of Virginia at Wise. Well, hey everyone, my name is Wally Smith and I'm an Associate Professor of Biology at UVA Wise. Uh, we're here on the UVA Wise campus today uh, to talk about vernal pools and other wetlands and managed landscapes. So how folks that have these types of wetlands on their private property can manage those and use some best management practices to benefit the wetlands and benefit wildlife. And I thought I would talk about this because even though I know there has been a past vernal pool talk, uh, as part of this program, I think back in 2022, there was a fantastic overview of what vernal pools are and some of the wildlife that lives within them. One of the things that we're seeing in Virginia, and particularly in Southwest Virginia, is kind of this misconception that vernal pools are only important when they're in a big, intact, forested landscape, somewhere that's kind of out in the wilderness and you've got a very undisturbed type situation. A lot of our wetlands though, especially our smaller wetlands in Virginia, are occurring in places like this one. They're very small, they're very isolated, they're pretty shallow typically. They don't look like much more than a mud hole like you see behind me, and they're also located in managed landscapes. Uh, here we're actually on a site that's experienced some former surface mining as well as some forestry activities, so this is a very heavily managed landscape that we have behind our campus, and it forms a great example for some of these habitats and why they're so important. So what I want to talk about first, kind of using this wetland as an example since it's such a small kind of isolated mud hole type wetland, is to talk about first what vernal pools are and why they're so important. Uh, a vernal pool technically is just a type of wetland that typically is very isolated so it's not connected to a stream input and also tends to be very temporary so you don't see it full of water or at least very full of water in parts of the late summer and then through the fall kind of our typical dry seasons here in Virginia uh, instead when we have in the late winter going through the spring into early summer you know, the rainier season the wetter season where there's snow melt and a lot of precipitation then these really small wetlands which often like this one are just in a small depression on the ridge top will fill with water and hold that water temporarily usually only to a few weeks to a few months and there's a ton of wildlife that uses these habitats even in a managed landscape where I am today as an example here on our campus we have around 20 wetlands a lot are actually bigger than this one and kind of look more like classic wetland habitats but when it comes to the habitats that wetland wildlife specifically select for their breeding this is one of our most productive sites, even though it kind of looks like a throwaway, you know, kind of worthless habitat. Uh, to give you an example of some of the species that are here, uh, we've done some work with our students on the EVA Wise campus over the last few years and found that this type of wetland is really critical, especially in formerly mined or logged landscapes for mammals. Uh, typically, disturbance activities will reduce the mammal diversity that you have at a site, but when you've got a wetland like this, embedded within the site we're finding that that attracts mammals from a lot of other habitats and kind of enhances the diversity that we have so it's important for a lot of those mammal species and then in addition uh, the big interest of vernal pools like this one is amphibians there's a lot of amphibian species that either live most of their lives here in this wetland or they come here specifically during certain parts of their life cycles to breed and this again is one of our most productive sites on campus for those species even though it's so small uh, at a wetland like this one we've recorded around seven to eight different amphibian species different frogs and salamanders that will use it again either permanently or temporarily but depending on where you are in virginia a small wetland like this one could have upwards of 10 or more different amphibian species that are there. Our most unique species that we have breeding here that unfortunately we can't see today because we're a little late in the season uh, is the spotted salamander, which is one of our largest terrestrial salamanders, so a pretty big salamander that typically lives up in the forest. It's terrestrial and burrows most of the year, so you're kind of lucky to see them outside of the spring. But in the late winter to early spring months, they will come, uh, in some cases a mile or more, across the landscape to these really small, isolated, kind of you know unseeming wetland habitats. And those are the places that they'll select to breed. And the males will show up first, the females will show up a few days later. Uh, they breed here, they lay their eggs, their larvae or their tadpoles, if you think about them that way, are gonna hatch out, they're gonna live in this wetland over several weeks to a few months and then they're going to transform to adults leave and then go back into the forest and these are the only wetlands where you tend to find those species breeding because there's not fish which are predators which will wipe out the eggs and the larvae and also they tend to retain water just long enough before they dry up for those salamanders to transform. And here again, we have huge numbers of spotted salamanders that come to such a small wetland like this one to breed. So what I wanna talk about today, kind of using this wetland and some others as a guide, are some best management 
practices and some strategies that folks can use if you've got a managed landscape that's been disturbed in some way like this one and some of these wetlands on your property. Again, because we're finding kind of this misconception that a lot of people in Virginia and Southwest Virginia uh, really tend to view some of these sites as not having value when they really do. And this example, just to talk about one best management practice very quickly that can benefit wildlife at a site like this is simply to kind of follow the leave it alone strategy. That just means if you've got uh, some type of activity on your property, whether that's future timbering that you're going to do, uh, some other kind of road management or trail development, simply try to route your trails and roads and other activities around these wetlands to limit physical disturbance. If you've got you know, ATVs, UTVs, any kind of equipment operating within the wetland that can crush and kill a lot of these animals, especially in the spring. And here on our campus, we've tried to avoid that. We've got a trail system that runs through here that's non-motorized. And even then, even though it's just foot traffic, we've taken special care to just simply move that trail out of the way so that folks aren't running through the wetland when they're back here. And that allows for it to kind of become a trailside feature that enhances the environment and it allows for those wildlife to survive. So this is just one of those habitats where we've got uh, some special protection that we've done, even though it again kind of looks unseemly. And some of the other habitats that we're going to have here behind campus illustrate some of these other practices that we'll see here in a few moments. All right, we're here at another wetland on our campus. This one obviously has a little bit different character than the one we were at before, which again was kind of a smaller, shallow, isolated wetland. Uh, the wetland we saw before that was so small, it's not gonna have any formal protection at the state or federal level. So, you know, management practices in that kind of habitat are strictly voluntary, but it's always good uh, to follow those just to protect that habitat as much as possible. This wetland is a little bit different situation. So it's much bigger, it's deeper. Uh, this is a constructed wetland like a lot of folks will have, even if you don't have a former surface mine like this one uh, on your farm possibly with a farm pond or a place you know, for cattle to come and get water. This area was primarily produced as a settling pond as part of the mining practice to come in and reduce uh, sediment loads in the surrounding streams. This site likely would be protected under state or federal law primarily because of its size and then also because it's connected to a surface stream. So those types of wetlands do have some special protection and if you have those on your property, are you ever thinking about doing any kind of disturbance practice in or around that wetland, it's always good to consult with a regulatory agency just to make sure there's no special rules you have to follow there. Uh, but at this site, even in the absence of those, uh, there are some challenges that can come up with managing a landscape when you've got wetlands and wildlife that are using these wetlands. I just want to mention here uh, in terms of some of the challenges that we have worked through here on our property. Uh, this site does not have quite as many pool breeding amphibians as the other site that we visited earlier, primarily because this is not a vernal pool, so this does hold water year-round. It's a much deeper pond. There are some fish here, so those fish become predators of the amphibians that will try to breed in this pond. So even if there's breeding here, a lot of species will get wiped out by the fish just coming and eating their eggs and larvae. But we do have a lot of frog species that still live here. Uh, bullfrogs, pickerel frogs, green frogs, kind of your classic uh, big pond or lake frog species that people are familiar with in the spring and summer. Uh, they'll breed here. Mammals, like I mentioned before, love this site. We have a huge amount of waterfowl uh, that come here. We have a great wood duck population that moves through at this particular site. And then we also have a lot of beaver activity here. This is a beaver modified wetland where there's a really nice intact beaver lodge kind of just out of the shot here across the pond uh, where I'm standing at this site. So even though it's not necessarily a vernal pool and it's not one of those shallow kind of isolated wetlands, there's still a lot to think about when it comes to managing this type of landscape within a broader area that's got different type of management objectives going on. And a great example here is what is all around me. So I've covered up around here almost by autumn olive, which is one of our you know, most predominant invasive species here in my corner of Virginia. There's some other invasives on this property as well. We have multi-four rows, a number of other invasive plants that were either planted here as part of the reclamation process with mining or have come in afterwards. And if you're a private landowner, you know, doing something on your property like timber management, this is probably something that you grapple with as well uh, with how to manage those invasives. And I want to bring that up in the context of this site because a few years ago, we actually undertook a project to try to reduce some of the invasives on this this property and one of the things that we had to grapple with is how can we address that invasive species management while also trying to protect the water quality and the wildlife that lives in a habitat like this one. If you're familiar with invasive species management there's really a couple approaches that most folks take for something like the autumn olive that you see here. Uh, one of those is a mechanical treatment where you come in and cut uh, either by hand or with equipment uh, the invasives themselves and take them out that way. For a lot of invasives, especially with autumn olive though, that's not really appropriate because they'll come back stronger after you cut them. So unfortunately, one of the best options that you have is a chemical treatment with something like an herbicide that you can apply to a site. And that is what we had to use here. Autumn olive does not respond very great to any kind of mechanical treatment. 
but we couldn't necessarily use what we call a broadcast herbicide treatment here where you literally you know spray the herbicide everywhere to treat a site mostly because we didn't want to get those chemicals into this wetland if we were using them in the uplands they were going to you know potentially run down into the water there's a lot of literature now that is showing that that causes a host of problems for amphibians and other wildlife whenever you get those chemicals into an aquatic system even if they break down and degrade pretty quickly that can still expose a lot of the wildlife that's here you know two potential chemicals that have some kind of harm so the solution that we found at this site it obviously was not completely successful because we still have some invasives here but uh, the solution we had to work around that was to do a cut stump treatment on some of these invasives where we kind of combine that mechanical and chemical treatment approach uh, coming in and cutting off first the autumn olive close to the stump then applying a targeted application of those chemicals directly to that stump as opposed to broadcasting it across the landscape that allowed for us to still treat some of these invasive plants while also not just you know broadcasting that herbicide everywhere getting it into that wetland that was going to be retained on that stump and that can be one approach if you have this type of situation on your property where you're trying to do some vegetation management really just limiting chemical approaches as much as you can is always a good practice for aquatic wildlife and if you have no other approach than to use some chemicals trying to do those targeted applications something like a cut stump treatment is really preferable just to make sure that you limit the impacts to the species that occur here so we're finally here at another wetland on our campus that as i mentioned before with our first site uh, most people would not look at and think was important at all it's just kind of a flat area here on the ridge top where water doesn't have anywhere to drain and as you can see around me what's happened here is that over time the water pools up uh, you've had some wetland plants get established and then as those plants die they go down and eventually begin to form those saturated wetland soils that characterize a wetland and right on cue when we walked up i promise i didn't stage this uh, we walked up and there was a little juvenile snapping turtle that was hanging out here in this wetland you may not be able to see it up close but i'm holding it here in my hand uh, this really illustrates i think why it's so important not to misjudge some of these habitats and think that they're not important there's a huge amount of wildlife living here that you never really see and this is a great example of it this is probably a juvenile uh, that was hatched out somewhere pretty close to here and has come to this pond to live uh, hopefully if all goes well it'll survive and live you know a long and productive life and then go and breed somewhere itself but what's well, kind of shown here at this particular site that I think is so important to recognize when you got these small wetlands like this is that it's good if you have these on your property even if they're in a disturbed condition like this one to periodically kind of go back and think about your management plan for your property and say are we doing things appropriately are there things you're doing well are there things you could be doing better with some of these embedded habitats and this site here in our campus I think illustrates a couple of things that we could do a little bit better with the management of this wetland uh, the most obvious that you see in front of me are the tire ruts that are coming through here somebody uh, not in an official sense has come through here very recently and they have taken a vehicle and gone through and basically gone mud bogging and they dug this out uh, this is probably somebody going renegade and doing this but one of the things we're seeing in southwest Virginia frequently is that a lot of private landowners that have old surface mines or old timber jobs are leasing out a lot of those properties for things like off-road vehicle trails and while that's a lot of fun you know it's good to go out and drive around and get muddy if you're taking your vehicles through even kind of an unassuming wetland like this one you can still cause a lot of damage because if this guy had been here when that vehicle came through it probably would be dead and it would have been crushed as well too even if you don't have turtles present you've got salamanders frogs their eggs and larvae they'll be crushed as well and it's the equivalent of destroying a nursery at this site because a lot of those animals can't go elsewhere so you know trying to manage your property in a way to where you keep vehicles other equipment out of these sites is really critical if you've got property that's open to the public for any reason uh, installing some barriers some educational signage letting folks know you know stay out of the wetlands with your vehicles that's a permitted activity uh, to drive on your property is important and then finally one other thing that's a little less obvious it's a really good management practice here at this particular site uh, is to make sure that you keep a buffer of unmowed vegetation around the wetland at this site we've not done a great job of that you can see some of the wetland plants around me but we do mow this periodically right up to the water or to the wetland margin and that can become a problem because a lot of the animals that live here like this turtle or the frogs and salamanders that might breed here they're actually vulnerable to predation there's predators that learn where these animals are and they come here and eat them uh, we see a lot of times things like owls at night will swoop down when the spotted salamanders are breeding and take those so if you've got good 
kind of thick, tall vegetation and a buffer around that wetland, that's going to make sure that those animals have a place to hide and stay away from predators. In addition, some of our frogs, like our spring peepers that have a really characteristic high-pitched call in the spring, uh, we heard those actually calling when we walked up here this morning, they'll actually climb up on some of that vegetation to call, and if you cut that down to the level of a putting green, you're not going to have that vegetation, that habitat structure that's there for those species. So it may not always be possible, but whenever you can, you know, these small wetlands like this, give a nice wide buffer of unmowed and uncut vegetation. It's one of those cases where a little bit of an unkempt habitat is actually good for the wildlife. And then around you as well, this is kind of a different site because we're out in the field, but if you can also retain a protected buffer of upland habitat around those wetlands, that's important as well because a lot of that wetland wildlife is going to live up in that buffer, up in the woods most of the year and then come down to these sites temporarily to breed or to get water you know for whatever reason so ensuring that connectivity between the upland habitats and the wetland habitats is going to be important i'll put our snapping turtle friend back here so it can enjoy itself in the wetland and these are things you can think about even with these very disturbed kind of unassuming sites with managing those for wildlife so finally, one of the things I want to talk about with all the wetlands we've seen today, whether it's some of these small shallow wetlands that are isolated or the bigger wetland we saw, is really why care about protecting wildlife there. As I've mentioned a few times now, these habitats don't look like much, so it's easy to discount them and think they're kind of these throwaway disposable habitats, but they're actually really important for a number of reasons beyond just the wildlife themselves. Uh, one of those, you're thinking about kind of a more human relevant reason to protect some of these wildlife populations, is that a lot of the amphibians, especially in these wetlands, love to eat things like mosquitoes that are a pest to humans or even a vector uh, for human diseases. So if you keep a really good healthy amphibian population here, they're going to do their thing, they're going to eat what they're going to eat, and that in turn can kind of be a natural type of uh, pest control to keep some of those populations down. And in addition to that, kind of more broadly, uh, amphibians, especially in these wetlands, are going to be both predator and prey. So they're going to eat a lot of different animals. Uh, there's also going to be a lot of other animals that will come and eat those amphibians. And that makes those amphibians an intermediate link in the food chain or the food web where they're getting eaten and they're also eating a lot of stuff. And when that happens, they're not just getting eaten, but they're also moving energy and nutrients throughout the landscape, especially for those animals that live up in the woods and come down to these wetlands tempor temporarily and then go back. If they get eaten here, they're inserting nutrients and energy into this landscape that was somewhere else initially. If they come here and feed and then they go back into the woods, they're doing the same thing in reverse. They're transferring some of those nutrients and energy back into the forest around them. So if you're managing your private lands for a healthy forest, keeping that in mind is really important the more intact you can keep that food web and keep the links in that food chain there, the better off it's going to be for the forest as a whole because ultimately all these organisms are part of that ecosystem and the behaviors that they do, the functions they have in that ecosystem, they're going to be basically a natural form of insurance to make sure that that forest stays healthy long term. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of 15 Minutes in the Forest. Mm -hmm.